Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. My guest today is Vince Romanin, the CEO and co-founder of Gradient, makers of a beautifully designed window-mounted heat pump. We've talked before on the show about the vicious cycle of, that air conditioning creates. It's a major contributor to climate change, but also becomes more and more critical the warmer the planet becomes. The International Energy Agency predicts that we'll need 5.6 billion AC units in buildings globally by 2050. That's roughly 10 new units every second for the next 30 years, tripling today's AC use. So the question becomes, how do we provide the temperature control people need with minimal impact to the climate? And I love the solution Vince and Gradient are putting out in the world. To introduce Vince quickly, he's a self-described thermo nerd who grew up in Ohio tinkering with motorcycle engines and model rockets. He has his PhD in mechanical engineering and heat transfer from UC Berkeley. And actually just yesterday, Vince, I recorded an episode with someone who called you out as the person doing something to fight climate change that is most inspiring to them. Oh. <laughs> nice. So I'm really excited to hear your story. It'll be a surprise. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, so it's Andrew Gillies. I think you guys were at Berkeley together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Andrew's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, but I just thought that was funny. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to talk to Vince tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we had a good chat about robots in the construction industry. So yes, anyway, Vince, thank you so much for joining. It's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dale. I'm excited to be here on the pod. So I'd love to just start to hear a little bit about your childhood. I found this post on your website that says you grew up working on motorcycle engines and model rockets. Like, how did that come to be? And how has that been an influence in, in where you're at today? I think I just grew up in the middle of nowhere and there wasn't a ton to do. So we didn't have much <laughs> of a choice. And my whole family was engineers. So I was kind of surrounded by engineers and people who were building things. And so I think... I would have been someone who just worked on engines or rockets forever. I think that was the natural path. I liked building things. It was kind of like the world that I was in for a lot of my childhood and undergrad education as well. But we had this kind of looming grand challenge of climate change. And so when you look at all of the all the challenges that we have to solve, and there are many of them, a lot of them have to do with the same types of thermodynamics and devices and engines that drive our cars and rockets, but also drive our um, energy economy and the way we live. And so that's kind of how I got focused on climate change in the first place. And then specifically, it, it looks like heat transfer is where you went in depth on your PhD. How did you choose that? I'm not sure why. I think it was because of the focus on engines and rockets. And I always thought thermodynamics was cool. I like moving things. I like physical things. Would have made more money as a software engineer. But I just liked working with the physical things. And so when I was an undergrad, I, I found an advisor who was super helpful to me, who also was working on a lot of things in that area. So my undergrad thesis was actually on building heating and cooling. And then when I went to grad school, similarly, I found, I found an advisor who was just doing a lot of really interesting things that, that I liked that were in that sector. And so that's kind of how I fell into it. And then you joined Other Lab. And I have a little bit of familiarity with that, but I'd love for you to share kind of with the audience what was Other Lab. And my understanding is that's kind of where the idea for Gradient came out of. So I'd love to hear that story. Yeah. So I um, just a kid from Ohio, came out to California for grad school at Cal. And then my first job out of Cal was at a company that does large scale solar thermal, which at the time we thought was a really promising way to decarbonize the grid. I think PV and batteries got cheaper way faster than we expected which is good, but was bad for the technology of solar thermal. And this was at a large company. I think that I really liked the work we were doing and I liked the people at this large company, but you just get slowed down by the large company bureaucracy and infrastructure. And so I got an offer at another lab, exact opposite, really small, creative in the heart of San Francisco. It's in a building which is a hundred year old pipe organ factory conference tables are made of old pipes and like people are just always tinkering and building things in the basement of this building. And so it was a great, small, quick moving, hands-on, close-knit community of like super nerds. 
And it was just really exciting to me after like working through the, the giant bureaucracy and red tape of a giant company. I, I just thought it would be an opportunity to do something different. And the people there were just all doing amazing things. And so I joined on a existing government grant, existing RPE grant in the solar sector. And then I kind of spent my free time building things in the basement, talking to some of the other folks there about what could be next and what the big problems were to solve. And it was kind of in that community where I came up with a like core thesis behind what would turned into Gradient. So Other Lab is really good at, at starting from first principles, starting from physics, understanding kind of what's behind something, and then looking at the data to drive to a solution. And that turned into a couple of things. The, I think one piece kind of at the center of the orbit that Gradient was orbiting and that the Electrify Everything Rewiring America project and effort was orbiting was this project that Other Lab proposed to the Department of Energy to build a very detailed map of energy flows in the US, a Sankey diagram. The Sankey diagram is a flow diagram where the width of a bar is the amount, is proportional to the amount of whatever it is you're measuring or tracking. And that bar will split off into different areas, again, proportional. So like it started with a steamboat captain named something Sankey. And he said, all right, we're putting in 100 units of coal. 60 units go to heat and 40 units go to the motion of the steam engine. And Other Lab basically was running a lot of grants with the DOE. They said to the DOE, if you want to identify the main areas of reducing climate emissions, you have to first understand how the country is using energy. And I don't think that we fully understand that yet. So Other Lab built this super Sankey diagram so that we could easily see and visualize and understand how energy was being used and how it was translating to carbon emissions. And one of the conclusions of that effort was the best way to decarbonize is to move all of our devices to electricity and to make sure we can get that electricity from clean sources. Gradient was parallel to that effort and said, we need to move our buildings to electricity. And then, of course, Rewiring America was the sort of spinoff that said, we need to make sure that policy happens to encourage electrification. I think the genius of Other Lab and a soft storytelling of this is that it's easy, memorable, and focused. And also, there's a clear story here how the electrification process is going to make our lives better. It is not a story of use less. There's no way to efficiency our way out of climate change. It is a story of our devices will be better and they will be fully decoupled from the pollution that they are associated with today. And by the way, that diagram is still on the internet. If you go to energyliteracy.com, you can play with it and you can see down to like 1% resolution where all of our energy is goes in the US. It's a really fun diagram. Yeah, I've looked at it. It's pretty insane. I definitely recommend people check it out. So does that kind of energy usage view of the world, is that what is driving the focus of gradient and developing heat pumps? Because my understanding is air conditioning is bad for the world, not just because of the energy it uses, but also because of the refrigerants it uses. Yeah. I think the common link is being based in data, right? I think that we have impressions of how much energy goes into things, but like it is incredibly hard for us to have intuition on this at the scale of the challenge of climate change, unless we run the numbers first and understand the boundary conditions first. And it is true that the emissions from HVAC are large in proportion to their energy. There are several sources of emissions in HVAC that make it more carbon intensive per service to the customer than you would expect. And those two things, again, when we went through the data, are refrigerants. The refrigerants that we use in our devices are strong global warming forces. And then second, which is also true of most other natural gas devices, that natural gas leaks more than we think. It's really hard to detect methane leaks. And so we haven't started doing that until recently. And if you leak 3%, it's somewhere around 3% of the methane that you intend to burn. You've doubled the carbon footprint of that methane, right? Because the global warming potential of unburnt methane is higher than the global warming potential of the resulting CO2. So when you add these two things together, you, actually, you magnify the energy, the carbon impact of HVAC compared to its energy use. Okay. So that because conventional heating depends on natural gas and... Conventional AC depends on these refrigerants, exactly. those two things together. Yeah. Really. And that's, and we should think about it as that's the main kind of emissions impact of HVAC more so than the energy usage. It is, yes. 
So ener- the electricity usage ends up being about a, a third, slightly over a third of the total carbon footprint, depending on how you slice it. That's how we slice it. And also, we can reasonably expect the carbon intensity of that electricity to go down. There are parallel efforts, solar and wind on the grid, hydroelectricity, to reducing that, whereas to shift out of natural gas heating, to replace it with something else, and to transition refrigerants are completely different efforts. And that's why this is, again, part of the magic of the electrify everything messaging and why efficiency isn't the only thing. You can fully decouple the service. You can get the same amount of heat coming out of your air conditioner or cool coming out of your air conditioner, heat coming out of your heat pump, but decoupled from the source of emissions. So you don't have to use less of the service. You can use the same amount of the service. It can just be decarbonized. We had some investors throw Jevons Paradox at us early days before there was like this giant movement around heating and air conditioning that if you make a device more efficient, you actually end up using more of the fuel. This Jevons was an economist during the Industrial Revolution saying, if we're worried about running out of coal, more efficient coal engines are not going to solve the problem. They'll make it worse. People just use more. They'll just heat more or whatever. Yeah. Right. But CO2 is a byproduct of the service that can be decoupled from the service. It is not a fuel. Like CO2 is not the input to air conditioning. CO2 is an output, and it's an output that is is not fundamentally tied to it. It can be removed if you use a solar panel, a better refrigerant, and a heat pump. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe we can break those things down. So heat pump is a way you can heat a space without using natural gas. And I don't know if this is worth doing on the podcast, but is it possible to just kind of quickly explain how a heat pump works? It's certainly possible to slowly explain it, but (laughs) I'm trying to quickly explain it. Okay. This gets back to my childhood wonder of thermodynamics and the magic of thermodynamics. A heat pump, it will heat your home more than the amount of energy you spend it to put into it, which sounds like it breaks the laws of physics, but it doesn't. Because what a heat pump does is it moves energy basically uphill. So energy moves from hot to cold. That's the way everything works. You can move energy from cold to hot, which is uphill, but you have to put in work to do it because you have to push the thing uphill. And that's what a heat pump does. It's literally like rolling a ball uphill instead of letting it roll downhill. And so you put work into a compressor and the compressor drives a refrigeration cycle, which expands and contracts a gas, which makes it cold and hot. And with like the magic of engineering inside that process, you pull heat out of the colder room and then you push it into the warmer room next to it. Your air conditioner is, from an engineering definition, a heat pump. It's doing that same thing. It's just pulling the heat out of a cold room, which is the inside of your home in summer, and dumping it into the hot room, which is the outside air in in summer. A heat pump just physically reverses the direction of that process. The difference between a heat pump and an AC is literally a $15 valve. And so it's easy to make our ACs heat pumps. The equipment is like 95% already there. It gets a little more complicated in practice because heating temperature differences are larger than cooling. So a bigger device than just an AC. But still, that's what a heat pump does. It does the same thing as your air conditioner. It moves heat uphill. Right. Okay. And kind of the less heat there is in the outside air, the harder, the more energy it exactly. takes to bring, to move heat inside. Right. Okay. But at the end of the day, you can, I mean, I bought a heat pump and I want to say it was like 300% efficient or something like that. It's effectively converting electricity to to heat at 300% efficiency, whereas natural gas is doing it at best at what, like, I mean, it'll asymptote around 100%, but it'll never go above it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All of your natural gas furnaces get close to 100%. The, we say coefficient of performance because the heat you get in the room is the heat you pull out of the outside plus the energy that comes through the plug. So actually your coefficient of performance in heating is always one higher than in cooling. In cooling, that isn't true. In, in cooling, that one that you're pulling out of the plug is dumped to the outside air, which is not useful. But in heating, it's useful. So anyway, the total heat of the room is what you pull out of the air plus the plug. And so in most cases, in most temperatures and climates, it ends up being around three. So you use one kilowatt hour of electricity, you pay for that, you get three kilowatt hours of heat into the room, which is great. And then practically in the worst, coldest temperatures, there are now devices on the market that will keep that coefficient of performance above one. So better than a space heater, a space heater by definition is going to have a COP of one. There's plenty of heat pumps on the market that will keep that COP above one, even in some of the coldest winters in places like Maine. In fact, Maine has the, one of the highest penetrations of heat pumps of any state in the US. Let's talk about the refrigerant side of it. So 
why are refrigerants so harmful? And kind of what's the state of refrigerants today? Refrigerants, easily one of the worst, from a planet perspective, one of the worst substances humans have ever made. So to drive a heat pump or an air conditioner or any of these processes, which by the way, is an amazing invention, right? Like before the invention of the AC, we couldn't make a thing cold. It would be impossible. And so it wasn't until these devices were invented that we could actually make something cold, fundamentally change the way we build cities. Phoenix, Arizona doesn't exist without this invention. Fundamentally change the way we store food. And the refrigerants we used in the early days were poisonous to humans. It was ammonia, usually. And so a guy named Thomas Midgley invented a substance. He, I think he worked in Japan at the time that was not poisonous, had no odor, was not flammable, and was useful as a refrigerant. It was a CFC, a chlorofluorocarbon. He actually drank it on stage to prove, or inhaled it, I forget, to prove how non-toxic <laughs> it was, which is the like, it's the like tech bro of like the yeah. 1920s. <laughs> Turns out that this is in the upper atmosphere, breaks down in a way that destroys the ozone layer. And the ozone layer turns out it's pretty important, protects us against harmful rays and protects plants against harmful rays. And so if we continue the destruction of the ozone layer, it would have been literally like a risk to all life on the planet, right? And so we replace them with a different refrigerant, HFCs, which are now causing global warming. So that means that to the two planetary scale, like this is disrupting the ecosystem of the entire planet or in, in no small part caused by refrigerants. And the interesting thing is the HVAC industry was pushing for the phase out of CFCs because they had patents on HFCs. And again, is pushing for the phase out of HFCs because they have patents on a successor called HFOs. HFOs, it's another manufactured flora chemical, which is also breaks down in the atmosphere to TFAs, which are a forever chemical that gets into ecosystems that we don't quite know the scale of impact. But from my point of view, I don't think we want to run this experiment with our entire atmosphere again, including the fact that the number of devices that use refrigerant is going to go up, as you called out, by about 3x over the next couple of decades. And so the, the quantity of refrigerant that's going to be in our built environment is just going to be unprecedented. It's going to be multiple times larger. I don't think we can afford to use a new substance, which is why Gradient and many others in the industry believe we should use a class of refrigerants called natural refrigerants, which are much more, they're more well understood, more environmentally benign, still very efficient. They have their own engineering challenges, but I think they're very manageable compared to running an experiment on quantities of fluorinated gases in our atmosphere. Okay. But the industry is not moving that direction generally, like the industry incumbents. I'm a little bit more optimistic about this than I was a year ago. And that's because Europe has placed pretty strict rules around TFAs, one of the byproducts that HFOs break down into, and has updated their refrigerant regulations to allow more natural refrigerants. And so Europe very much seems to be moving in that direction in a way that is probably, I hope, big enough to pull the rest of the world and industry toward that solution. It's not done yet, of course, and world's much bigger than Europe, but it seems like there's a lot of movement toward natural refrigerants and toward uh, restricting the applications for HFOs. Yeah, just thinking about kind of the scale of the problem, that number I said at the beginning that we're, what was it, 10 new units every second are being deployed, just, and then whatever refrigerants in that unit, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but ref whatever refrigerants in that unit, that's kind of there for the life of the unit yes. and potentially leaking, and then, you know, you've got to deal with the end of the life of this stuff. And you know, yeah, it doesn't affect us a ton, right? You buy a new air conditioner, like it has a different sticker on it and you're fine with it. But the truth is, especially in a lot of developing countries where you'll need these devices even more, they often have old hardware and they can't buy the new refrigerant for it anymore, right? Like the refrigerant doesn't exist and the cost of changeover is more significant to developing economies. And so like there is a real price of a refrigerant transition that I think we don't always see. And if we are beating this drum of we have to save the climate and the planet and mitigate global warming, and then in another two decades, we're like, oh, all of the heat pumps that you bought have to now be replaced with this new thing because there is some other problem. I think it's really going to burn public confidence and motivation in doing anything for the planet. And so I think the industry has done a great job of saying we have to phase out HFCs. That was, it was the right thing to do, and we are doing it. I think we also have to be aware of what we're replacing them with and make sure we transition to something that is a forever solution and not going to create another environmental disaster in two decades. But I don't think the public can handle that whiplash again. And just so I understand, the, these refrigerants, their negative impact happens 
whether they're or when either they're leaking or at end of life if these things if these pieces of hardware with refrigerant in them aren't disposed properly is that the right way to think about it exactly if you had a system with zero uh, leakage over its life and you recovered all that refrigerant instead of throwing it in the landfill you would mitigate a lot of the effects of it doe estimates that in a hermetically sealed hvac system like your window ac that the leak rate's about one percent per year which is pretty small if we could maintain that leak rate everywhere, we would solve a lot of the refrigerant problem. They estimate that if it's a system that is has field connections, it can be 8% per year or higher, and that is the problem. And then, of course, it's end of life, right? People are very unlikely to buy a $200 window AC off Amazon, and then when it's done, spend the time to make sure it's recycled properly. Okay, so let's talk about your solution. So I've seen on your website, I've actually seen it in person, this beautiful window unit. It doesn't require a professional installer. Can you talk about why that was the solution you chose to all these problems we just talked about? Yeah. So I think I already had a beat to death the climate side of this, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a big part of it, right? We knew we had needed decarbonized, a decarbonized technology platform. But the other piece that's kind of core to what Gradient does is that I think it's two things. One, we know this technology will not scale enough to have an impact if it's not a fundamentally better product for people, right? Like we're not just building something better for the environment, we're building something better for your home, your room. And when we talk to people, the biggest pain point we found, the, the biggest like, I'll do anything to get rid of this was people who had a window AC. Often it's in multifamily buildings in cities where you're worried about it falling, and where natural light's at a premium, you don't have that many windows, like you want the natural light and the fresh air. And so people wanted their window back. And this is the thing that we said, this is something that the users care about so strongly that it is the right kind of drive to get these systems deployed quickly. Going back to kind of a electrify everything, our lives will be better if we do this right, but your car will be faster, your uh, stove will be heat, boil water faster and be more effective, and your home should be more comfortable. You should get your window back. Your home should be quieter, right? It should be a better experience. We believe that is necessary to scaling. And the other part of it is the comfort of your home is super emotional, like very, it's a part of your home that people care a lot about, but the devices we use to make our home comfortable are often very unintuitive to use and ugly and noisy and just not great products. And so we thought there's an opportunity to just make people's homes better. One of the early books that I read when I was starting Gradient was a book called Thermal Delight in Architecture. It's a very nerdy book by an MIT architect. And one of the points that she makes really eloquently throughout the book was that controlling all of our buildings to be 72 degrees all the time everywhere is like an interior designer deciding that everything in a building should be blue. There's so much varied experience and there's just so much opportunity to do more to make our homes comfortable. I think the best examples of that in home HVAC today are things like Radiant Forest, right? It's a super comfortable, unique experience that it isn't just a baseline of I'm not uncomfortable, like it is added comfort, it's added experience to your home. Okay, so you're specifically kind of targeting the market that's currently using window AC units as your primary market, is that right? I think that, that our primary market uses window AC units, but I think the bigger focus on this market is if you have a window AC, you're probably an older building, you probably also have old heating equipment, and that heating equipment's probably also being replaced. An example of this is Local Law 97 in New York City. It is a, a law that says that buildings are going to be subject to fines if they don't reduce their carbon footprint, which effectively means that they need to replace the steam boilers with electric heat pumps. These buildings also happen to have window ACs. And so it's kind of, from a building owner's perspective, electrify and reduce emissions. It is a heat pump sale to them. But the benefit to the residents and the people that are using it is that it is a much better heating and cooling experience than the products they use today. Okay, got it. In those cases, at least, are you selling to building owners because this is their path to decarbonizing by replacing their heating source as well? Or do you sell to individual renters and, and unit owners? We've sold both. When we started, there was not a big focus on building emissions or heat pumps as a solution, but we kind of knew or hoped or expected that it was coming. And so in the early days, a lot of our customers were folks who wanted their window back and that was it. But we were building it as a heat pump platform because we knew this wave of electrification needed to come for us to mitigate emissions. And so we also have customers who are the building owner looking for an electrified solution to heat. And also having that mix of customers really lets us 
understand and focus on the user experience. We get a stronger direct connection with customers via those early direct-to-consumer sales that makes sure that we are building a fundamentally better experience and a better product and focusing on the residents' experience and not just on the building's energy efficiency. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like what you've been able to do because it's a direct user installable, potentially any consumer could purchase this. You have a direct relationship to your consumers. Is that a fundamental benefit to the way you're doing business? It gives us more opportunities. I say it gives us more options, right? We want to work with installers in many cases. And we, especially in the early days of the company, a lot of customers said, I want a heat pump and I have to pull teeth to get it, right? I called an installer and they said, don't do it. It's even in San Francisco, where like the winter is so mild. Yeah. And I think it's because, I mean, it's partially rightly so, right? Early heat pumps were not delivering the right customer experience and installers are rightly so focused on their customer experience. But the technology's evolved and it's harder, it's hard today for installers to know what technology is going to be reliable and drive that experience because it, there's a long chain from the designer to the distributor to the installer to the user. The installers don't always get that direct feedback from the user after it's done. And so Radiant's approach lets us close that loop between customer feedback and hopefully drive a better experience that will give installers confidence of how the product's going to work. The fact that our, our device can connect to the internet lets us do much better diagnostics and debugging and understanding of the experience. And so we hope that one day installers can way better understand the experience with a gradient and they can install 10 gradients in the time they can install one existing type of heat pump. And so we both want to enable installers, but we also want to go through other channels as well. What is it like having this product in an industry that's so, it, my sense is that there's such deeply entrenched incumbents and I would assume you see them as competitors at this point. Like, what is it like playing in that same space with them? Do you have any indication of how they see you as a company or how do you view them? Yeah, it's awful. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I think that there's, yeah, it's definitely an industry with a lot of inertia and slow moving. It's a double-edged sword actually, right? There's a lot of headwinds in getting folks to change the way they do things. There's a lot of folks who are risk averse and rightly so. But the other side of it is that there's because the industry hasn't changed in so long, there's also a lot of opportunity to deliver better customer experiences. And I think that's what drives it, right? That's why we needed that customer to say, holy shit, if I got my window back, I would be so excited. Because if you don't have that strong tailwind of like excitement and things that you couldn't do before, you, I don't think you could get over that inertia of the existing HVAC industry. So it's a double-edged sword, right? If you're in an industry that's more open to innovation, it gets saturated quickly with new solutions and you have the opposite problem. And so we definitely chose our battles here, right? We knew that by being a hardware company, it was going to be harder and slower to scale. We knew that being an HVAC, there's going to be a lot of inertia. But we also knew that it meant we could deliver amazing customer experiences and that we could have a, a really big impact, right? We see our impact not just as the systems we deploy, but we hope We are building awareness for heat pumps broadly, educating people on why electrification is going to make our lives better, encouraging other folks in the industry to also move in this direction, which will help build the ecosystem for products like this, and also help the world move toward better refrigerants. And so that's why we chose this despite the challenges. But if you can avoid building a hardware company, I recommend it. (laughs) Okay. So you're an engineer. You've gotten, you're deep in the heat transfer space. What have been some of the biggest challenges of designing and building the Gradient product? I mean, hardware is fun. I like building things. It's super cool experiences. Like you get to build a prototype and put it in front of someone the first time. And you just like get a lot of excitement from people when you see the new thing that like you can't always get with software. So hardware is fun, but it's even harder in HVAC than it is in like electronics, right? We have DigiKey in electronics. You can buy all the parts from your circuit board and get them overnighted. We have McMaster for nuts and bolts. You can get any part you want overnighted. There is nothing like that for HVAC components. If you want an HVAC compressor, it is hard to get it, right? Because most of the companies building devices with HVAC compressors are large companies that have established relationships with the manufacturers. So in the very early days, supply chain is really difficult. It's hard to get the components you need. And then once you're kind of through that stage and you have the supplier relationships and you're scaling, it's also hard because just the general inertia of hardware. 
There's nothing crazy fancy about refrigerant charging and bracing, right? It is a fairly well-understood manufacturing process, but it still takes time to scale. The good news is once you've gotten over that hump, it's a significant moat. It takes time to get there. And so you should be able to get that investment back because you're, you're well protected. But it takes time and it's slow. And it's one reason that we've tried to keep a very strong focus on the customer is because you've got to build the right thing. You don't have time to iterate. You've got to really understand your customer and build the right thing the first time because an iteration is very expensive. Yeah, so I got to see your unit at, you had a happy hour during Climate Week in San Francisco and I got to see it and actually experience installing it, which is, I mean, hats off to you, like a really elegant, well-designed experience. I'm curious what the process was to get to that kind of user experience, because I imagine there's a lot of kind of industrial design considerations and ergonomics and just the engineering of the mechanisms involved and stuff like that. And it's, I mean, how heavy is the unit? What's just the way? The, the heaviest single piece is the outdoor unit, which is 90 pounds. Okay, 90 pounds. So you're kind of, you're putting this 90 pound thing, hanging it out over the outside of your window in a way that feels very safe and secure. So yeah, I'd love to just kind of hear what the process was to get to where you are with that today. Yeah, it is funny. I've installed so many of these now and I'm guessing most people listening haven't installed one, but you, we literally, you open the box and the instructions tell you to install this bracket and then push a 90 pound box out your window. Right. And we're telling this to people who are on like the 14th floor of a New York <laughs> City apartment exactly. as an example. And I think one thing that helps is the baseline is a window AC, which is an absolutely terrifying install experience that is a normal part of many of our lives that we live with for some reason, but it is terrifying, right? Like we think our system is much better than that, but still we're a new product and a new experience. So like we're going to be held to a much higher standard. And I think that we early on, one of our first investors was one of the co-founders of, of Nest, Matt Rogers, who's now at Mill. He introduced us to some of the design, some of the former, the main former designer at, at Nest. His name is Rocky Jacob, also now at Mill with Matt, but he's an amazing industrial designer and really helped us like set the vision. I think that I realized after the process, like how much good industrial design looks obvious in hindsight. You know, you spend a lot of work and then you build a thing and then to everyone else, it looks obvious, right? This was a piece of this was the getting your window back right? We asked ourselves, how do we make a window AC look good? And we realized that is not the thing that you should do. People don't want to look at their AC. They want to look out the window. And so just adding a shelf to the top of the unit, like brought focus and functionality to the window itself. So that the thing you're looking at is the plant sitting in front of your window. And the same thing for install. We understood that the way to get these systems into buildings needed to be easy, not require technicians, be scalable, be fast. And so we designed a way that would do it safely and that would also enable service and repair. It's super easy to pull our system back in if you need to for repair or for replacement. And we tested a lot of weighted boxes and different springs and mechanisms so that the ergonomics of like how you get this box onto the windowsill, how it slides out, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what the force profile is as you're pushing it down to like just really make sure that we were both making it robust and easy and serviceable, but also kind of like the hardware itself is meant to manage the anxieties of someone doing it for the first time. There's meant to be audio feedback and visual feedback so that you, it is clear that you're doing it right and that there's no way to do it wrong. If you do a step wrong, the design doesn't let you. There's interference, there's checks and blocks. Uh, knock on wood, I'm sure as we scale, someone's going to figure out how to do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But the design is really focused on making sure we're communicating to the user that they're doing it right and that it is that there's no possible way to do it wrong. Yeah, no, it's true. It feels very kind of confidence inspiring. Just, yeah, you can kind of hear the ratcheting mechanism as it's going. And yeah, it feels like, okay, this thing is strong. It's safe. <laughs> like I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Is there anywhere else in the system that you feel like you're innovating that you'd want to call out from a hardware perspective? Yeah, I think that this is a thing that just we're doing. This is the thing that we hope the whole industry does. But our device has variable speed drives and compressors and fans, everything in the system, and has a Wi-Fi connection. Most of our HVAC infrastructure is not connected to the internet and uses a single speed compressor. The compressor is either on or off, which means to modulate temperature, it just turns on and off. This is inefficient because every time the compressor does that, the refrigerant pressure equalizes and you lose a lot of that built-up energy. It's awful for the user because you don't get as fine control of temperature and airflow and noise. 
And obviously, it's bad for the future of the grid because these devices should be smart and connected to the grid. If we're going to fully electrify a building, buildings need to manage electrical loads internally, right? Your EV charger needs to know that when you plug it in at the end of the day, you're about to turn on the stove and that it should wait to charge until you're done cooking on your induction stove. Similarly, your heat pump needs to know that if you're about to cook dinner, it should pre-cool the home. Or if there's about to be a peak in electricity prices, it should pre-cool or preheat the home. If we do this, it is possible to electrify buildings faster and cheaper and provide a better user experience. And so the future of electrification has to be with some level of energy management of devices. You don't have to call it smart grid. It's probably going to be something like virtual power plan. Like people have some like ideas that Internet of Things means that like you have to control everything through your Wi-Fi router. But really, it means that energy is managed so that all of the devices in your home work effectively. It means that your battery pack and your solar panel can be smaller. And it also means that you don't have to do a panel upgrade to your home, which is an incredibly expensive process. And so having variable speed drives and internet connection on these devices just really adds a lot of value to the user experience and to our uh, experience of electrifying our energy economy in general. Yeah, I guess that, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way exactly before, but we're, as we electrify everything, all of these devices are kind of dependent on the same energy source and kind of flattening out the peaks is really critical. So to the extent they can all sort of coordinate, we'll better be able to use that renewable energy. Makes sense. When you talk about decarbonizing HVAC, efficiency is probably fourth on the list. The first thing you should do from a numbers perspective is electrify heat. It has the biggest carbon impact. Better refrigerants is probably close to second. And then smart control, making sure your heat pump can run based on a signal from the grid or the home so that you can use more solar is probably, it's really hard to predict exactly, but it's probably as big of an effect on carbon emissions reduction as the fourth thing, which is just efficiency. So efficiency ends up being really important because it will control how much capacity of heating and cooling you can get into the building's electrical system. Efficiency is probably more impactful because if you're efficient enough, you defer the need for an electrical upgrade, which is massively expensive but it's probably somewhere around fourth in terms of carbon impact of HVAC. Mm, Yeah, that's really helpful framing. Thinking about the future of Gradient and the industry, what are you most excited about kind of down the road for your company or where the industry is headed? Yeah, I think I'm most excited for driving more of those amazing customer experiences. Like when I talked about the keeping building 72 is like painting everything blue, right? Like the pleasurable experiences we can drive with these products I think we've only scratched the surface with that in like giving you your window back, allowing more natural light, giving you a shelf in front of your window. We have a much better sound profile because of our variable speed drives and because of our architecture. Eventually, we want to do things like control when you bring in fresh air and maybe we control smart blinds in the window so that you can time your heating and cooling with natural light through the window and just like making people's homes more exciting, more comfortable easier to use is is the most exciting thing for me, right? Like we don't see the PPM of CO2 in the atmosphere go down, but we do see like people excited by our product. And like a layer of this is the removing of guilt of uh, knowing that they can be, have a comfortable home without having to worry that they're compromising the planet. And it's a nice to have for us. It is a need to have for a lot of people around the globe. And so I hope we can all move the industry toward people having access to that without compromising the planet. I think that's what's most exciting for me. Yeah, I love that focus on the customers first, kind of. It's one thing I've learned with digging into climate tech is you can't just focus on climate impact as your product. These things need to be adopted. And at the end of the day, it's about making lives better anyway. So that makes a lot of sense. We talked about five and a half billion AC units by 2050. What portion of that do you think Gradient is wants to be responsible for? So we, I think that report comes from IEC. Mm-hmm. And I think in the same report, if not IEC came up with a similar number to that, says that most of these are going to be room ACs, which means an AC that cools only a single room, like a mini split, as opposed to a central ducted AC, or as, as opposed to a VRF. A gradient is, of course, a room AC. Like we design it to, to cool roughly one room. So if you have a three bedroom apartment, you probably have four gradients. Anyway, I think that most of the growth in ACs is happening with room AC because it is a retrofit problem, right? It's people getting access to their first AC in an existing building. And so I think we can cover a lot of the market, but 
hardware takes time to scale. And these systems are being bought like today. And so if we, I think we only have to cover one or 2% of, of it to be wildly successful from a numbers perspective. I think the most important thing for me is that we do it with heat pumps that use the right refrigerants and that are ready to build the smart grid of the future. And so if we get a small enough percentage of it to be successful of a company, but we ensure that all of these new devices, all of these like new pieces of infrastructure that we're going to be stuck with burning energy for the next decade or two are the right hardware that will be incredibly happy and successful. Yeah, and hopefully it influences the rest of the industry to move in the right direction too. So three last questions that I ask of everybody. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of our planet and why? Yeah, this is an interesting and hard question for me because I think for the planet, I'm optimistic, right? I think the planet's going to spin whether humans are here or not. So <laughs> True, I, yes. <laughs> I think for me, climate change is really about people, which of course is what you mean, right? Like mm -hmm. Michael Jackson said it best, we are the world. <laughs> we're the same <laughs> planet. We mean us. But it's going to be a very different experience for a lot of us on the planet, right? That over almost 2,000 people died in the 2022 Pakistan floods, right? That the worst case of, or not the worst case, but like our worst fears of climate change are here today for many people. But the other side of it is going to be true for other of us. Some of us are going to have like amazing electric cars and heat pumps and solar driven homes. And our cars are going to be faster and our homes are going to be more comfortable. And we're going to see the benefits of the transition to an economy that mitigates climate change. And so it's going to be different for all of us, unfortunately. And I think a big part of what we should be doing is trying to limit the externalities of the choices we make, one of which, of course, is climate emissions. So I'm optimistic for some of us and not less optimistic for others. And it's almost the wrong question of like, what is it going to net out to? Because we'll never really know. We don't have the ability to like internalize the net outcome of all of the multitude of human experiences. And so the question for me is like, have I done something to move us in the more optimistic direction? Have I done something to like help in my little world move the needle in the right direction and mitigate the worst effects of climate change for some people? And I think it's also like the most useful answers to that question between optimism and pessimism are calls to action, right? Like, what can we do? And so that's kind of what I think about for my own sake. Like, am I going to be able to move the needle here in a meaningful way or not? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a really good reminder. And yeah, the more I learn about this, the more I realize like this is a very different problem depending on who you are. Everyone's experiencing this differently. Who is one other person or company doing something to address climate change right now that's inspiring you? This is a good question. I'll have to mention my friend Andrew, who's not at Urban Machine. He was yeah. one of the first friends from grad school. I'll mention someone else too. I can't just throw it back. He's one of my first <laughs> friends from grad school who started a company and coming from Ohio to California already exposed me to the startup ecosystem. But Andrew was like, he was on the ground doing it from day one, which is really exciting. And I'm very excited about his new company. Also, I was, I was thinking of mentioning Rewiring America, but we've already talked about them way too much. I think that the I've learned more recently how coupled this challenge is to public understanding of it and to politics. I think being an engineer, you think everything is a technology and a widget problem, and it's really not. Politics are a big piece of it. I really like the folks at companies like Block Power and Sealed. The CEOs of both companies are doing amazing work on the education side and the removing barriers from customer side. And both of them, like us, are working in an industry with like massive headwinds and just have a ton of vision for how this could be better for people and are uh, doing it in, in this really old industry. And so I'm a big fan of both of those companies, Lauren at Sealed and Donnell at Block Power, both amazing leaders. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I've seen Donnell speak a couple of times on panels and stuff, and he's a really inspiring guy. Awesome. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate today who wants to do something to help? I went to this talk by Tom Steyer. Someone asked him a similar question, and he said something that stuck with me, which is people used to talk about if you're working at an internet company or not. Like some people had jobs at internet companies and some not. <laughs> and now like the internet is so pervasive. It is like, it is the air you breathe in a company. Like it is ridiculous to think you don't work at an internet company. And I think, and he said, and I think I agree that the same thing's going to be true with climate, right? Climate is literally the air we breathe. And so I think after thinking about that, my advice for people is you should still focus about what you're good at and passionate about and excited about. And there's going to be a climate lens for almost anything. So you should think about how you could take your world and the things that you're excited about and make sure that they're doing the right thing for the planet and the climate and for people and not doing the wrong thing. 
And so that's my advice is like, you can still lean into your area and what it is that you're excited about, but understand how it intersects with climate, how it intersects with the communities who are affected by it and mitigating those effects or how it intersects with emissions or how it intersects with some other environmental impact. I love it. Vince, that was really informative. I always appreciate any time I get with you. I feel like I come away learning so much and inspired. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It was great to be here. I appreciate you having me and looking forward to episode being out. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.